This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson. This week, what does the hand you use have to do with what makes you, you? I do think it's a little bit of my identity. I have to say, when I meet somebody and they say that, they're left-handed, there's some type of bond or kinship. An exploration of handedness when Radio Health Journal continues. I'm Reed Pence, the producer and host of Radio Health Journal. If you like listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics, from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. When we focus on technologies, it's often actually the affluent in society who get to adopt the new technologies, like if you think about the Tesla electric car, for example. The state of climate science in the U.S. Then, A fair amount of people do experience what sometimes is referred to as compulsive buying or compulsive shopping. A lot of studies now show that about 5% of all people may experience problems like that in their lifetime. The downsides of shopping till you drop. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Radio Health Journal and Viewpoints on your favorite radio station. And subscribe and listen anytime on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. If you stop and think about it, being right or left-handed is an integral part of what makes us who we are. Many lefties are proud that they might be more creative or quirky, perhaps even smarter than their right-handed peers. Today, positive stereotypes generally dominate the conversation when it comes to talking about lefties, but it hasn't always been that way. Ron Yeo is a Regents Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of New Mexico. He says that once upon a time, being left-handed was not a desirable trait. The interesting root of the word for left-handedness is sinistral. And in a lot of the literature, you see lefties referred to as sinistrals, which, of course, you know, stems from the same root as the word sinister, which isn't exactly an attribute you pick for your friends and spouses, you know. So that kind of connotation has been there forever. As to exactly where it came from, oh, who knows? And if you're identified as being weird in some way, it's pretty easy to see how some kind of superstitious ideas evolve around that. Kim Sawyer is aware of those old myths. She and her father are both left-handed. And while she says she hasn't faced any discrimination or negativity due to her hand dominance, her father did just a few decades ago. What my father told me was when he grew up, it was completely frowned upon. They would try to force him to be right-handed in almost a cruel, sadistic way. I think he had told me that certain religions saw it as a sign of the devil that you used the wrong hand. He told me that for many years as a child, he was uh, forced to use his right hand. Claire Porak is a professor emerita of psychology at Penn State University and author of the book, Laterality, Exploring the Enigma of Left-Handedness. She says that the practice of making kids switch hands was once fairly common, especially before the 1930s, but even more recently. Former President Obama talked about pressures to switch his left-handedness when he was growing up in Indonesia, but he resisted the attempts and remained left-handed. And one of the things I did find is that people who resisted the attempts and continued with their left-handedness were often people whose parents intervened and supported their left-handedness. So what makes a person right or left-handed? Yo says it all has to do with your brain. Right-handers and left-handers have somewhat different brains and that the ability to use one hand uh, slightly better than the other is a reflection of the better skill that the part of the brain that controls that hand has. Although handedness has to do more with brain function than personality, many stereotypes and myths about left-handers have persisted. Kim Sawyer has heard many different things as a lefty. Some of the things that I've grown up hearing about is that lefties are more creative, that they tend to be smarter, that they find other lefties that they um, hang out with. Yeah, I definitely see more creativity. Uh, A lot of the lefties that I know are actresses, musicians, writers, artists. So I definitely see a correlation with that. They think differently. 
Intrigued by these stereotypes and other possible differences between righties and lefties, scientists have undertaken a whole raft of studies comparing the two groups. There's an immense literature on are lefties more apt to be this or that and so forth. And I should caution you and your listeners that a lot of that research is messy and that studies sometimes point one way and other studies point a different way. So in some of these research domains, a really clear answer has not yet emerged. It's so easy to study handedness. You know, all you got to do is ask people, are you a righty or a lefty? And then, you know, you got the beginnings of a study. Because it's so easy to do, so many studies have been done. Yo says that some studies have shown a higher than expected incidence of left handers with mental retardation, with developmental disorders like autism, and with schizophrenia compared to right handers. Despite the results, Yo cautions that all of these topics deserve more research and that the jury is still out on these issues. Professor Porek, on the other hand, finds studies on disorders like schizophrenia potentially problematic. Take schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a brain disorder, developmental brain disorder, in which there are a number of things that go wrong in the development of the brain as the person matures. And it could very well be that the development of left-handedness is actually a byproduct of the schizophrenia rather than left-handedness being a cause of schizophrenia, which is a way that's often, you know, approached in the popular media. So there are a whole range of studies that have linked every possible disorder to left-handedness, but mostly one would argue that if there is an increase in left-handedness, for example, among people who have a particular disorder, it might be because of the fact that the brain has developed atypically, not because they're left-handed. Horak thinks that stereotypes and myths around lefties need to be corrected, at least the ones that might be harmful. Perhaps as scientists, we haven't done as good a job as we could do. For example, the myth about left-handedness and creativity, I think, you know, left-handers kind of uh, hold that very close to them. They're, They're very proud of that. So that's one of the things that maintains it. But these ones about left-handedness and disease are ones that I wish would go away because they're not true. Either way, it still seems that whether you're right-handed or left-handed has a lot to do with how you view yourself. Take Kim Sawyer, for example. Most of the people I'm in closer relationships with are left-handed. My husband's left-handed, my father was left-handed, and a lot of my close girlfriends are also left-handed. I do think it's a little bit of my identity. I have to say, when I meet somebody and they say that they're left-handed, there's some type of bond or kinship that you feel because it is a rare occurrence. And it always never ceases to amaze me, oh, here's another person that's cool and left-handed. Ron Yeo agrees that handedness does have to do with identity. The interest in doing research on handedness really stems from the basic observation that People are different in that regard, (laughs) you know. Studying handedness kind of gets you at something that may be distinctly human. It may help us understand how human brains differ from other primates, and that's really potentially informative about human nature. So that's the research end. We do think of ourselves as handed. It's part of our identity. You know, I think of myself, I've done the research on this stuff. I'm extremely right-handed, not just right-handed, but I might as well put my left hand in a pocket and leave it there for the rest of my life. My handedness is something about me as much as kind of my height is or my hair color. You know, it's an obvious kind of thing that defines me and distinguishes me from some other people. So I think it fits in with those other kind of characteristics that if people do define themselves in that way, then, yeah, they search out literature and research and are interested in questions about that. You can find out more about all our guests through links on our website, RadioHealthJournal.org. Our studio producer is Jason Dickey. I'm Nancy Benson. Radio Health Journal returns in just a moment. With many opportunities to celebrate during fall and winter, preparing foods for all the festive occasions can be both a joy and a challenge. Selecting basic foods that can work in multiple ways, such as fresh grapes, can simplify things greatly. According to registered dietitian Courtney Romano, health advisor to the California Table Grape Commission. Fresh grapes are beautiful. They taste great and are easy to keep around for everyday eating as well as special occasions. Keep some on hand for a healthy snack option. Arrange them in a pretty bowl for a classic and edible centerpiece or in small clusters on a serving platter. Use them as a special ingredient. 
Heart-healthy grapes can be dipped in dark chocolate for a delightful dessert that is good for you, too. Heart-healthy grapes from California are in season from May through January. Grapes of all colors, red, green, and black, are a natural source of beneficial antioxidants and other polyphenols, which may help contribute to heart health. Visit grapesfromcalifornia.com for more information. For those who qualify for Medicare, fall open enrollment is underway now. If you pay out of pocket for prescription drugs, choosing the right Medicare prescription drug plan can help save money. Picking a plan that fits your needs can be a simple process with these tips and by working with a trusted partner like Walgreens, who has a number of tools available online and in store. First, evaluate your plan every year as coverage and benefits change. Also, talking to an independent insurance broker can help, which is why Walgreens teamed up with eHealth, an independent fully licensed insurance broker to offer free advice, which may save you hundreds of dollars and no obligation to enroll. Last, check if your pharmacy is in your plan's preferred network. A Walgreens pharmacist can help lower costs by finding generic alternatives or a lower cost brand name medicine to treat the same condition. Visit walgreens.com slash medd to learn more and get started. That's walgreens.com slash medd. Multiple sclerosis affects an estimated 1 million adults in the U.S. alone. In multiple sclerosis, the immune system mistakenly attacks the central nervous system, affecting a person's muscle control, balance, vision, sensation, and cognitive function. Though the exact causes are unknown, Epstein-Barr virus, a very common virus which causes mononucleosis, is the only risk factor identified to date that appears to be necessary for the development of MS. An investigational therapy called called ATA-188, specifically recognizes Epstein-Barr virus-infected B cells. It is currently being studied in a clinical trial, which is now seeking participants. If you or someone you know is living with progressive MS and is interested in participating in the ATA-188 clinical trial, please email patientadvocacy at atarabio.com to learn more and find a trial site in your area. That's patientadvocacy at ata R-A-B-I-O dot com. An estimated 23% of people will experience a bunion, a condition where a bone in the foot grows out of alignment. With traditional surgery, bunions come back about 70% of the time. Now a treatment called Lapoplasty 3D Bunion Correction addresses the root cause of a bunion with a demonstrated low rate of recurrence. Dr. Paul Dayton of the Midwest Bunion Center in Iowa explains how it works. Pain from a bunion can be severe and make it difficult to be active. With the lapoplasty procedure, we use precision technology to secure the unstable joint and realign the bone. In our practice, many patients are back on their feet in a walking boot within days. One study showed that 99% of patients still had a successful bunion correction after 17 months. More than 20,000 patients in the U.S. have been treated with the lapoplasty procedure. It is covered by most insurance plans and Medicare. For more information or to find a surgeon who offers lapoplasty, visit alignmytoe.com. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Radio Health Journal is a production of MediaTrax Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. Even the patients I see who tend to be COVID deniers seem angry. You know, people in general seem more angry, and that's an effect of it. How COVID stress is wearing down almost everyone. Then music therapy. Probably the most common misconception is there's the therapist and then there's just somebody listening to music. But it's actually in actively engaging in music making that we have the most greatest potential for change. All that and more on Radio Health Journal. Thank you.